year and a half ago, I suppose, I heard that I'd got this big grant from the ERC, the European Research Council, for a five-year project to study the history of yoga, in particular the physical bits of yoga. And I invited 20, the 20 best scholars of yoga in the world, and Sanskritists, so people working on Sanskrit texts uh, from which we can learn about the history of yoga. And they all said yes. You know, it's absolutely fantastic, really like a dream come true. So these are texts that still are only available in manuscript form. So there's, you, know, you can't go out and buy a book about this text, you can't buy a translation, it's just in, available in manuscript form in libraries in India or all around the world. And then we sit down and we try to make sense of them. So literally, you know, puzzling over syllables or wor you know, words, and you know, sometimes we'll spend 10, 15 minutes like, trying to work out exactly what's going on with one word or you know, how it fits into the meter of the verse. Uh, let's read. Uh, so the first verse, very nice. Sri Kantha Kantha Luthita Dhara Pallava Srihi Sri Natha Bhaksha Shikritang Risharo Ruha Srihi Sri Vasa Yoni Mukha Pankaja Lochana Srihi Srihi Sri Prada Bhavatusha Jagato Mala Srihi On the basis of meaning as well as on the basis of these metric patterns and on the basis of grammar and if we have uh, different sources like this manuscript is having uh, one reading, another manuscript is having another reading, we can compare and choose, uh, we can have some guess what is behind uh, and so on. Parihariya mo uh, Moham uh, having removed uh, the delusion, confusion of uh, one's mind. Kritwa uh, Bapusthirataram, this is also maybe uh, interesting, uh, made the body firmer, uh, steady. Sthirataram uh, Pratyadishiddim, a meditator, a yogin, achieves, uh, finally attains perfection. Can I go back to the Vyasadhyaya? Yeah. I may have missed something. What was your suggestion? Samasadhyaya, Vyasadhyaya. Uh, so, thinking that it would be too much elaborate. Yes, I thought that, I, I agree with that, except that I suspect that it should be Vyasa Bhya, I think. So, some, something's gone wrong there. Impossible, yeah. Mm. But as I told you that the transmission is really mm. problematic, out of 400 verses, we have only 243. Mm. Mm. So, I come now to the question of philosophical underpinning. Um, this is a rather big topic. Um, but uh, I try to, again, just say something very simple and elementary about it. You remember that the poor Vipakshan, uh, I had imagined him saying, well, they are all Yogacharas or Madhyamakas. In any case, they cannot possibly believe in the existence of external objects, including the body. External means external to mind. Uh, and far from believing those external objects to be real, they believe that their appearance is a symptom of error and is caused by our mistakes, let us say, or the, the, the our habitual uh, yeah, this, uh, ignorance. Okay. One of the texts I'm working on, a recent discovery, is that the earliest text to teach the practices of physical yoga was in fact composed by Buddhists. So I had to completely revise my understanding of the history of the whole tradition that I've been working on for 20 years or whatever. You know, hang on, suddenly the, the root text of it is Buddhist and not Hindu Tantric. Hatha Yoga is, is not, a, it's not a religion in itself. In fact, the texts are, are, are pretty non-sectarian. But at the same time, it's clear that this text was written within a Buddhist community. Yeah, hi. I'm Dr. S. V. B. K. V. Gupta. I'm working for this Hatha Yoga project as a researcher to collect various manuscripts in India in different libraries. First, we, uh, we take the references from the catalogues then, uh, then we go to the libraries without mishandling them. We, 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 it is very comfortable to scan them uh, with our scanner. So we scan them and we use for the research work. Uh, this will be a rather informal presentation. See, yeah, so this is one. Bauer dates it to the end of the fourth century, second half of sec second quarter. So what is Particularly nice for me is that, uh, you know, since you have a whole leaf, you, you can see uh, many features of, of early uh, portraits that you, you don't see uh, in, 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 uh, even in, in some of the oldest palm leaf manuscripts. This is a collection that is not, you know, catalogued anywhere. This is a collection of 
from Bengal. It was given by Evans Vents to Johnston and then here to the Bodleian. And it's kind of, uh, it's made up of these uh, Bengalese manuscripts. But I wanted to show you this. This is simply a um, part of the collection which is not cataloged at all and you, so not, nothing is known about it. There's some great, great scholars at this workshop, but the real guru of, of all of us is, is Professor Alexis Sanderson, who is my PhD supervisor at Oxford. And he, he spent seven years in Kashmir in the 70s, living with a traditional tantric Shaiva guru. And he's then spent the rest of his life um, studying the traditions of tantric Shaivism. So Shaivism is like the worship of Shiva. So I began looking in this literature to somehow um, build up an understanding of the historical process which led to the traditions I was studying in Kashmir, which were late, highly sophisticated, very learned traditions which rested on a long prehistory. So I've been trying in the last 40 years to um, expose that history, um, and to get some sense of how the religion developed and changed over the centuries. But there are other areas of Indian religion which have remained completely obscure, um, have not been looked at, and yoga is certainly one of them. And uh, Jim Mallinson started getting into this area um, and did his doctoral thesis on a text which seems in many ways to be continuous with Shaiva yoga tradition. And so the question was to what extent, how, is, how are these two bodies of meditative practice related? Um, how has uh, the Hatha yoga tradition, say, or the uh, tradition of other yogic groups um, positioned itself in relation to these dominant cultural forms that the Shaivas developed? And in this way, through this careful analysis, looking at many unpublished texts, he's gradually built up a picture uh, of how this trend in Indian religion became central and influential in many different sectarian groups, and how eventually it became mainstream. And then the rest of the text goes to each of these centers and tells the yogin what he will hear as proof of the fact that he's now penetrated this level. Of course, because the words are non-semantic, because they are onomatopoeic, um, the manuscripts have, a, have trouble with them <laughs> because they're not as were in the dictionary. So there are quite a few variant readings, which is a problem for a yogin who's listening out for the required sound. <laughs> Did I hear shimmy shimmy or simmy simmy? <laughs> And are you sure it was dhumu, dhuma? <laughs> so it's like when you put your hands against your ears, you hear some subtle sounds inside, but they're supposed to change as the mantra rises through these levels until it departs from the body. So I take the lead of the venerable feet of Abhinavagupta. Iti natravi vadbir asmabhyam asuitavyam. I pray that the learned will not be too angry with me. Uh, I wanted to end with that because I think it does show that the tradition is undergoing constant transformation. But the sad thing is we always, I always feel as a student of Shaivism that in the background is something even more weird and interesting, which I can't quite, I can't quite reach through the texts. Hmm? So Stoman notes the, the curious divisions of the Sri Tattva Nidhi and, and the confusions in the texts such as asanas being referred to anaphorically before they're described and illustrated, which shows that you know, they've, kind of, they've moved around. The Hatha Vyasa Padati has 112 postures, while the Sri Tattva Nidhi has 122. Six of the extra postures here, um, 75 to 80, are simple classical seated postures. So Sukhasana, Singhasana, Bhadrasana, Virasana, Padmasana, and Siddhasana, ending with Siddhasana as number 80. And the poses after 80 are said to be additional. So all, all those extra poses of the Hatabhyasa Padati sort of are, you know, are dumped at the end. Um, and I think this, this indicates clearly that the compiler had an agenda to make a set of 80 asanas. He, he believed that there should be, you know, the, the, the grouping, sh there should be 80 asanas and they should end with Siddhasana and, uh, and these other poses. Um, and it's, which strength, strengthens, I think, the hypothesis that the reordering of the HAP's postures in the Sri Tatvinity was a conscious and intentional choice by the redactor, if, if not a wise choice. We have, of course, complex asanas, but also quite a physical type of pranayama, where the breath 
is manipulated, the inhalation, the exhalation, length and perhaps in the breath held. Well, in Hatha Yoga, it's more similar to some of the Karanas in the sense that, uh, but there's different terminology. They're not called Karanas, they're called Bandhas and they're integrated with the phases of the breath. So as the yogin breathes in, uh, he at the end of the inhalation applies the chin lock and the root lock, he grips the anus and squeezes the chin like this and then he draws the navel in and up towards the spine which causes the diaphragm to hyperextend. He does this while holding the breath then at the end of the uh, ex breath retention he releases the chin lock but then uh, actually exaggerates the hyperextension of the diaphragm ex using Uddiyana Bandha and then holds Uddiyana Bandha while breathing out and this enables the practitioner to breathe out for a very long period of time. There are many forms of yoga and very important in the history of uh, the evolution of yoga is uh, the Shaiva Tantras. You sit in a posture which is conducive to meditative activity and then you concentrate on God. And th there are a lot of breathing exercises but no complicated uh, stretching exercises. And a lot of uh, ritual, in fact, tantric ritual involves uh, things that you're doing really with your mind. You're not, uh, you, so you, you, um, you cultivate the divinity in your heart, which is of course not the physical heart, but this imagined heart in your, in your yogic body. And before you project the same divinity that you will worship in an outs outside substrate. Uh, so there's all sorts of different approaches uh, to these texts, to the history of yoga. Uh, for some people it's much more uh, personal in terms of how they're going to apply these things. And for others it's maybe a more intellectual academic pursuit. But those two don't have to be in opposition. And I think for these Sanskrit intellectuals or authors themselves, this is an interesting question of were they themselves practitioners, those who wrote these texts, or were they simply academics? I'm inclined to, to think that they were practitioners often themselves, uh, based on the content and the exquisite details of these postures, some of which we saw today. You can see that a lot of this information would have only been written by somebody who had actually tried and sort of tested these things out. Yoga today is quite contested. You know, what is it? There are so many different traditions. So there's Iyengar Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga, Bikram Yoga, Shivananda Yoga, um, Hot Yoga, Flow Yoga, Power Yoga, all these kinds of yoga. And then there's Hatha Yoga. It was really interesting to see them using their, their knowledge of their bodies and what their bodies could do and, and have that help us interpret the text. And it was intoxicatingly beautiful to watch, wasn't it? To hear the Sanskrit, to see them practice. Kurpara Paryantau Hastau Dharama Vashtabhya Januni Nabhau Sankuncha Tishtet Chattakasanam Bhavati Supporting oneself on the ground uh, with the hands as far as the elbows bend the knees at the navel and remain thus this is the the chataka asana the uh, sparrow posture so <laughs> I read the Sanskrit and I, d I translate it I have no idea what I'm going to see when I look to the left sometimes <laughs> This is, the, this is Iyengar himself here, this is Gita Iyengar, and I think this is, uh, so his daughter and his son Prashant, I think, number three along on the wall there. And this is the kind of things that, that people still get up to in Iyengar Yoga Studios today. Um, so he, he very much, I think, uh, pioneered the use of, the use of ropes. Um, in her book, Gita Iyengar's book, uh, Yoga Gem for Women uh, of 1983, Iyengar's daughter, described seven rope postures, referring to the technique as yoga kurunta, strangely, and translate, translating kurunta as puppet, uh, because the practitioner resembles a puppet on a string. Okay, so my name is Daniela Bevilacqua and I am a team member of the Atta Yoga Project. Actually, I am the ethnographer of the group. My purpose is to collect information about the ascetic practitioners of uh, Hatha Yoga in India today. 
to put together the development of the practice over the centuries and to create comparison between what is written in the text, what is represented in the temples and what they are doing uh, like today. Many, many sadhus appreciate the fact that uh, we are actually working on this kind of project because yoga is a, a very important element of uh, Indian religiosity. And then they were very helpful with my questions, they gave they give me a lot of examples. But on the other side there were also the skeptical sadhus that uh, don't understand this kind of research because they think of course, for them, uh, yoga is more a uh, religious discipline. It's something that cannot be understood simply reading or talking about it, but has to be experienced. And so it will be a m bit more difficult to get information from this kind of uh, ascetics, but I'm quite good in that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's it. This is my work till now. So let's see the next time what will happen. If I will be still alive, who knows? <laughs> after, I mean, after Kamakya, let's see. <laughs> after Kamakya. Yeah, after Kamakya, it can be they scary. Have like female victims. <laughs> oh, thank God. Not a goat. <laughs> One thing I would like to add is just uh, to acknowledge how incredible a workshop like this is and how it, what an exciting time it is for yoga studies. Uh, we can almost take it for granted being at a conference like this to have such a learned audience uh, and group of scholars, of Sanskritists, of specialists in yoga and Indian religious traditions all come together. But this is actually something quite new and novel that's happening right now. And it really speaks to the work that folks like Dr. James Mallinson and Jason Birch and Mark Singleton are doing. I mean, 10 years ago, this was not happening. If I told somebody I was uh, getting a PhD in yoga studies, they would just scoff and laugh at me. But today it's actually really earning the respectability in the academy. And as we can see with the grant like the ERC, even from the European Union uh, and the Research Council, it's actually getting funded at the government level. So it's almost like in the medieval period when you'd have kings uh, who were patronizing some of these Brahmin intellectuals to write these texts. Today, the, the, the government is actually paying scholars like Jim and Jason and Mark to study, to analyze and uh, contextualize these texts. It's been a really good process of, of looking at the materials and trying to incorporate that into my practice and how that would feel in the body. Started off just reading them going, this doesn't make sense, how do you get your ear to your thingy? And I'm used to learning in a very traditional manner where it's taught sequentially, you're given a posture by your teacher, he might demonstrate it, but usually they just tell you what to do. And then you practice that for years before you get something else and you're expected to get a, a, a good level of proficiency before you move on to the next one. So to come to a written sequence with no person to guide and no person to demonstrate, it's been a totally different experience from how I normally practice.
Yeah, I'm really happy with the way the week went. So we kind of covered various extremes of scholarly endeavour from the highest flown philosophy to just basic philology, what we call trying to make sense of text. Learning is collaborative. You know, you can't do this stuff on your own. You need to build on the work of others. There are a lot of students here who have just been in awe of these absolute kind of masters of the Sanskrit scholarship who've been at it for 20, 30, 40 years at the top of their game. And they'll be inspired by that and they'll make relationships and then they'll start their own research projects and so forth. And yeah, so this, hopefully this will kind of keep the, the tradition of this kind of scholarship invigorated as well. Yeah, it's a great opportunity uh, for me to attend and present about my work in the, uh, the Great Hatha Yoga project here in London at SOAS. It's really uh, a fortunate for me to express my views in front of advisory panel of Hatha Yoga project. Yeah, for me it's very interesting and uh, because usually when I work we don't use text because it's very rare that aesthetics have read, are reading text so for me it's very important because then I, will, can create, I can create a kind of comparison between these two approaches not the textual and the practical and then uh, yeah especially the last part I mean I will think and I, I will try to memorize what did they do like the two girls to see if I can see among aesthetics this kind of practices it's been a really exciting week to be a part of to come along to the discussions and to hear the enthusiasm and the expertise with which all of these people are sharing. They really are sharing where they're at and what they've been working on for so many years on different texts. So to be a part of that and to see it is thrilling. Well, the workshop is great in the sense that it might have seemed very disparate and it might have seemed a lot of very philological, but that's because there are so many different schools of yoga and some of them are rather more distant from modern yoga. And what we're trying to do is examine the roots of your guys and those are in all sorts of different traditions so many people had to come together and we discussed many things that seem really really far from the yoga that people recognize today and uh, I th thought that it was uh, very good it had more spectacular moments and slightly duller moments <laughs> certainly some very unphotogenic moments I would have thought <laughs> their way of combining the text and embodied practice and interviews with sadhus and images it is, it is groundbreaking.